Imagine cold calling a C-level executive at a Target account where he or she personally picks up the phone and agrees to a meeting because they just happen to be seeking a solution like yours. Stop imagining and start dialing with Discover Or, the world's leading prospect intelligence platform. Visit discoverorcom forward slash SDR to learn more. You're listening to the Sales Development Podcast, the only audio forum focused and dedicated 100% to sales development. If you care about growing your skills and getting more new sales appointments, pipeline, and closed one deals, you came to the right place. Subscribe to the show on YouTube, iTunes, or Spreaker, and be sure to go back and listen to all the episodes for the best strategies, tips, and tactics out there on running a high-performance sales development program. And now, your host, founder, and CEO of TenBound at TenBound.com, David Delaney. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Sales Development Podcast. I am super excited to get the next guest on the show, Mr. Rex Biberston, founder and CEO of RexB.co. How you doing today, sir? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you doing, Dave? Oh, I'm doing great, dude. Thank you so much for being on the show. And yeah. I definitely am excited for the listeners to hear more about you and also the book that you just put out, which I think is amazing. So thank you. Thanks for coming on. Rex, if, if folks don't know you or haven't come in contact with RexB.co, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this. Yeah. So I call myself the outbound sales professor and I think it comes from my background. I, I always wanted to be a college professor, right? I thought it would be so cool to teach in front of the classroom and I've got good handwriting. So that helps. I just love talking with people and, and coaching. So I found that those same skills could be applied without the bureaucracy in sales. And that's where I really built my career was in, it was inside sales, originally B2C. Now I do B2B sales and, you know, I've had a lot of fun doing that, but I also get the chance now to do more training, more coaching. So I consider myself, I finally get to be that professor I always wanted to be, but I don't necessarily have to get tied down with the publish a paper every six months or you're going to be fired. Right. Exactly. And, and, uh, the only downside is you don't get tenure. Right. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we, well, we, hey, we gotta hustle. Guys, we're not really people for tenure, you know. We're not the base <laughs> salary kind of people. So, uh, yeah. You know, that's interesting because your co-author on the book is yeah. um, Ryan Reisert, who I, mm-hmm. I think he's a great sales sales professor as well. Yeah, it, absolutely. How, how did you guys uh, get connected? Gosh, I think he read an article of mine. I don't remember how we originally connected, connected, like, uh, you know, somebody sent a connection request on LinkedIn, but we were connected at some point and he messaged me and said, Hey, I really like your writing style. Do you want to write a book? Like, I, I don't think we had another conversation before that. If we did forgive me, Ryan, but I, that was like the most impactful conversation we had was like, do you want to write a book together? And wow. so like 45 days later we had a book. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. And, and this is, you know, I, I, I want to talk about that process of writing, you know, sure. and how you guys, you know, connected and made this happen in 45 days. That's really interesting to me. But before we move into that, the book is called Outbound Sales, No Fluff. Yep. And what I like is the, the, sub, the subsection or the sub headline is yeah. written by two millennials who have actually sold something this decade. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. So tell me, how did you come up with this? What's it about? And how does it, how does the book kind of help people? Yeah. You'll know it's kind of an organic title. Cause I think Ryan and I spent about three minutes thinking of it and it was just <laughs> there, right? You know, you talk about these startups who spent days and weeks just laboring over what's their company going to be named. We're like outbound sales, no nonsense outbounds. Like we just, we knew what it was about. And we knew what we were about. And, you know, in the very no fluff style that we have, we decided, yeah, that's going to be the title. That's it. Nice. And then the subtitle, I think actually Ryan came up with that. I loved it because, you know, as young guys, we kind of struggle to, we we don't struggle to stand out. We stand out plenty in the market, but we, we struggle with this idea that you've got to have 40 years experience selling at some big telecom company, or you've got to been in business for 30 years consulting to be this, this brand name. When most of the innovations over the last five years have been such that if you haven't kept up on this, you know, your sales skills still matter, but the process side, the technology side, all of that's been so outdated so quickly that young guys, uh, you know, those of us who have experience, young young men and women who have experience in sales can come in and really have an impact as consultants, as coaches, as trainers with just the fact that we've sold something recently. Like we know how sales happens today. Maybe not how it happened in the 80s or 90s, but we actually know how it happens today. 
And so it sounds like a little bit of like shots fired, right, at those who uh, are consulting all the way from back in the 80s. But a lot of those people have kept up as well. So this is kind of, look, if you don't think young people can do this, we can do this. Okay. So it's it's not as much like, hey, you've been around since the 80s, so you're a dinosaur. <laughs> it's more oh, like, yeah. it's more like, hey, we actually do have credibility because things exactly. are changing so fast. Yeah, if you look at the back of the book, and I know we'll jump to that later, but there's an appendix of resources, and we've got sales thought leaders in there. Some have been around 40 years, right? Like we totally respect and have built our careers on the learnings that we got from them. It's not like we came up with how to sell on our own. These processes and, and trainings have been around for a long time, and we were educated on the backs of all their hard work. So we don't want to put them down in any way, shape, or form. It's just, look, you can be young, you can have credibility, you can be great at your job, and, and you can keep pressing forward. Definitely, definitely. And, and I, I agree that the technology changes in the sales field have been like head spinning, you know, yeah. in the last oh, just, yeah. just five years. And, you know, if you there's a list serve called the acronym is MSP. I can't remember what it stands for. So mm-hmm. like, uh, but it's it's a group of basically they're sales technologists who are trying mm-hmm. to figure out how to plug everything in together and make it work. And it's just fascinating to see how fast it's moving. And, and, oh, yeah. and definitely, I, I think coming up in that, it's a big advantage for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. I, I had the, the fortunate blessing of being a part of InsideSales.com and their real heydays. I was there when we went from about 350 employees to 700 employees. And gosh, the things they could do inside a sales force that you couldn't do with other tools at the time. And the things they can do now are still incredible. But man, just being there when they... We're making these huge moves. They built this platform after 11 years of really stacking all these tools together. That was kind of part of the birth of this sales acceleration movement. I greatly benefited from being a part of all of that. And so, you know, I'll always, I'll forever be grateful that I moved from selling alarms door to door to working at InsideSales.com where I was. And I've, I've kind of followed that movement ever since. It is. It's been a crazy, I mean, I would say 10 years, you know, yeah. of, of, of development in the sales world. So, now, okay, you you took your experience and you guys got together and you sat down and this book was produced in 45 days. Take me through how that took place and then, you know, how is the book kind of laid out to help people? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sure. The process is, it was intense. I'll tell you that. We're both family guys. We both have, uh, we're both married. We have kids. I think Ryan has one. I've got two and a third on the way. So we're busy people. But we also prioritized the book during a short period of time. And this was kind of like we both knew, look, we're either going to do this all right now or we're not going to do it at all. And I see so many people posting on LinkedIn about, I'm going to write a book. I want to write a book. Or 2017 was the year to write a book. 2018 is the year I'm going to write my book. You know, like we knew we had a very finite window during which I had client work, but I wasn't full up. And Ryan had client work. It wasn't full up. And it was like, Ryan, we got to do this. And so he, he brain dumped all these ideas. He's been coaching sales reps for years. He brain dumped all his ideas. I filled in all the gaps. I kind of put the structure around it. And then we reworked it in a way that uh, we thought would be most beneficial. You and I were talking about this before the recording here, but we did it as quickly as we could. And I think we had the manuscript in under 30 days. It was actually the, the part of like, all right, getting it out to the masses. How do, we, how do we print this thing through Amazon? How do we get a cover on it? It was the tedious little details that took the extra 15. But I mean, I'm sitting here with a book in my hand I never thought I would produce. And we did it really, really quickly because we used Google Docs. We chatted on LinkedIn and text back and forth. And we had a book done really, really quickly. Yeah. And, and it's just a high quality book. It's a high quality read. And, and it's very relevant you know, content, it seems, has a very short shelf life mm, nowadays, yeah. especially with what we were just talking about with the with the technology. But this is a very relevant book for 2018. And the, the content is super high quality. Take Thank me you. through if, you know, if someone I, I think this is a great book. If someone's like, I'm a sales rep and I need to fill up my pipeline myself or, you know, I'm starting a company and, you know, we, we, we need to go out and get some big customers. Like, take me through the, the, the flow of this book. Where do we start? Yes, we really try and lay a foundation of just the right mentality behind sales because people get into sales for the right reasons sometimes, but for the wrong reasons a lot of time. Uh, you know, one bad reason to get into sales is because you don't know how to do anything else. And somebody said it would be easy, <laughs> you know, like door to door sales guys get this a lot, you know, salespeople end up selling door to door because somebody said, well, you can make money in the summer. 
okay, I was a door-to-door salesperson. I definitely know that pitch uh, that recruiters use. But we wanted to lay the foundation of, all right, if you're in sales just to get your own and get out, that's not the right mentality and you won't make it. Like you're going to get replaced by technology. If you are, if you've got the right ideas, you know, you're actually out there to help people. You actually care about connecting with people and providing solutions for them. You're going to be extremely successful. It might take some time. And I think that's one of the keys to recognize is just because you're great at sales doesn't mean you sell everything tomorrow. Uh, But we kind of lay that foundation in, in the first chapter. Then we talk about who you should be targeting from a company perspective, how to actually sell to the people in those companies and then where to find them. And from there, we kind of go into the actual tactics, like the strategies for contacting, how to manage your day, what tools to use. We really, this is one thing that Ryan and I struggled with the, the initial version of our book. We were thinking, all right, well, let's inject some tools and technology we really like, but that would be irrelevant in six months, right? That could, that could really be dangerous for the content of our book and the quality of it. So we put them as an appendix because great tools come and go. But the principles behind outbound selling successfully never die. Really, they've been the same for years and years. So we we don't really talk about technology in the sense that, like, here's a specific tool you should use. We add that to the back of the book. But we do talk about how technology can help you in accelerating your success in sales. And then ultimately, we give you the math behind how to fill your funnel. Like, if you want to close one deal today, how many opportunities does that mean? How many presentations does that mean? And how many calls does that mean? How big does your list have to be? So we we walk through from the basic mentality all the way through how many calls do you need to make tomorrow? So that by the time you finish the book, included in a, a workbook in the very back, you should know exactly what you need to be doing tomorrow to be successful. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's like the, the title is so relevant because it's no fluff, right? And that's what I liked about it. It's It's lean, there's no extraneous, you know, fluff. Well, there's only basically. 37 pages of actual content. The rest is, you know, appendices and our homework, the stop and take action section, which we love. Yeah. But that's it because our goal wasn't uh, to write a huge book that people would dive into and then forget about or that people would say, hey, this is the foundational principles of sales and you need to dig into this and like adopt this methodology. It was really like, okay you've got five days to fill your funnel. What the heck are you going to do with those five days? That was it. We just wanted to help people answer that question. Right. And, and it's, it's very timely for right now. Like this, this will probably go live in, in February, but it's still, it's still going to be the, the first part of the year. Sure. And, you know, I think with the way that a lot of sales teams are structured, if there is a sales development team that people kind of, you know, they, they kind of, expect to get leads from marketing or the sales development team. And it's almost, you know, they, they don't think enough about, Hey, I, I can't rely on anybody else. Like I, I have oh, to fill yeah. up my own funnel and especially, yeah. you know, you and I are, are business owners, right? And we're just like, mm-hmm. there is no, <laughs> there's no, there's no support <laughs> I have no here. Backup, I yeah. have no backup team. <laughs> I am the SDR. Yeah. Well, one thing that is really interesting too, that you touch on is, the first lesson in the first chapter, which is nobody cares about your product. And I, I think yeah. that that's a mindset that we have, to, we have to understand and come to grips with. Because I think that when you come in and you start working at a company or you own a company, you think about how great your product is and how great your company <laughs> is. And we have a ping yeah. pong table and all this stuff. But it, Well, at, the more outs- awards you've right. won or the more VC capital or whatever you've raised, I mean... Yeah, it's like, well, we deserve customers because yeah. we have such a great product. Exactly. And and so it's like, how do you recommend, you know, people shift that attitude from all about me to, you know, more of that that helping people solve their problem mentality that you go into in the first couple chapters? Yeah, I, I think that's that's probably a, a you know, over the length of your career you'll come to build that skill set. I don't think it's something you can just snap on and off like a light switch. I think it starts with at least acknowledging that you have to solve a problem or there's no purpose in someone buying from you. So as great as your product might be, just make a list of the problems you solve and live in that list. Just know that list inside and out. And every conversation you have with a prospect should be around deciding whether or not they're experiencing those problems. And if they're not now, will they in the future? And how can you help guide them along that path? Because your product being cool or being great, being the best, whatever, 
that's absolutely relevant once you've established they have a problem that you can solve. That's it. If you haven't established that, your product can be as cool as you want and it will mean nothing. You know, I hear that a lot in the language of people when they're talking about uh, their product or service. They, they focus so much on them and you'll start to talk more about your prospect, but more importantly, you start to listen. You'll stop talking so darn much on prospecting calls, right? You actually get them to generate the conversation for you uh, rather than the other way around where you're talking 99% of the time and they're just answering yes or no questions. So I would say first make the list of the problems then figure out how do you really get a conversation to the point where people are admitting they have those problems or recognizing that they're going to in the future. How many more meetings could you set if your team made three times more calls per day and connected directly to decision makers? How much bigger would your pipeline be if you booked 20% more meetings this month? Don't wonder. Check out DiscoverOrg at discoverorg.com forward slash SDR for personalized demo. No, I love it. And the analogy that I kind of thought about as I was looking at that is it's almost like a a doctor's office hmm. and not, uh, you know, this is, this is a pretty wild connection, but <laughs> with a salesperson, you're, you're almost like a doctor in some respects because an inbound lead is like someone who comes in and has a problem and you're just trying to figure out what it is. And if, if you can provide <laughs> them with a solution, it's like yeah. a patient. Oh, no, you, you need a <laughs> proctologist. You came to a podiatrist. Sorry. Right. Sorry. I can't help you there, but with an outbound, lead it's kind of tougher because you know you're you're kind of if you think about it you're kind of a doctor going around and saying do you have uh, you know this specific (laughs) illness that i can help you with and most people are going to say no i don't right yeah yeah and i think uh, a comparison to a proctologist would be appropriate there right it's it's hard to get them to admit that they do have the problem or that (laughs) they want to get checked out for that problem because uh, it's uncomfortable yeah absolutely i think that's a good analogy We've got to have that mentality though, right? Of going in there, trying to solve a problem. Otherwise, your product is just another piece of software. It's just lines of code or your product is, you know, your service is is worthless because it can't help people. And if you're trying to get a sale, I think this is the rise of client success and kind of that whole movement is fantastic because it's focused on renewals. It's focused on the benefit to the actual customer. I don't think that's yet reached the salespeople, right? And it's setting those expectations early making sure that what the salespeople say and promise is actually being held up by client success. I think client success is actually getting into trouble where it was, it was the sales rep who did it wrong. So if we have that mentality, it's certainly going to help the entire business end to end. Yeah. And I think that it, it, we're at kind of a, a weird transition point in the whole sales industry because it's, it's almost like the old mentality of just close close the deal, bring in the money, just say whatever you mm-hmm. want, you know, yeah. to to get people to do things, you know, it, especially if they buy a subscription because then they just mm-hmm. churn, churn out. Like to your point, it's changing, but I don't think that we've quite figured out how to make that change. And and I think that we still yeah. seem to celebrate the old way of doing things where you, you know, that pushy salesman mentality it seems well yeah and i think yeah. it's unfortunately partly how we compensate it's the the bonuses the quotas the numbers around the front end of that process around the selling that are going to get us into trouble right because i always say that people will do what they're incentivized to do and if you incentivize your people incorrectly if you're incentivizing them to close a deal and forget it you know set it and forget it you're incentivizing them in the wrong behaviors they're absolutely going to be successful in the wrong behaviors And that will come up and catch you, whether you're a subscription service or not, it will absolutely come back to bite you. Yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting. You know, most of the listeners on this are in sales development, right? So they're, Mm -hmm. they're either following up on the inbounds or they're going outbound. And, you know, what, if you think about this sort of approach that you're advocating, what do you think would be a good way to incentivize those sales development folks? Is it, setting up meetings? Is it pipeline? Is it just revenue that comes in? What do you think would would incentivize them the best? I think it depends on the sales cycle, right? Because at InsideSales.com, my first real B2B outbound job, we were incentivized by number of appointments qualified. So held and qualified turned into qualified opportunities, which is a pretty traditional, that's like a pretty standard uh, compensation. And then we also got, I think it was half a percent of a closed deal. So it was a little bit, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was enough to really get me jazzed. I think 
uh, some more interesting models that have come out or might have been around so longer than I know about them. But more interesting models are like the pod model where everybody's kind of working together towards a common goal and they all get bonus together uh, where they have kind of different functions within that. I'm not entirely sure that I would recommend for everyone to just go out and say based on qualified opportunities plus commission on closed deals, because sometimes those closed sales, you know, if you're working enterprise, it could be six to 12 to 18 months away. That's no incentive at all. You know, so it's really a good question that I think every business has to answer for themselves. But I I think you have to think about, is it incentivizing them to the right behaviors? Is it incentivizing them to put in any opportunity? And then is the sales rep incentivized to qualify opportunities that are going to move through the pipeline? Are they incentivized to qualify opportunities that are going to help their friend hit their quota? You know, you really got to think about that as well and have some some real clear oversight into the qualification process as well. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, I, I think that it's, you know, it's easy to kind of fall back into what everybody else is doing or the playbook mm-hmm. that you were using at your old company. But, you know, having an open mind and trying to, you know, make the incentive process customized to your company is huge, you know, and your marketplace is huge. Yeah. I even, there's all different ways to do it. I, I read a book called The Sales Machine by Justin Rolf Marsh, which advocates not even having quotas and not, not paying an adjustable uh, you know, uh, yeah. compensation plan, which will cause every salesperson in the world to go to scream um, <laughs> and run away probably. But yeah. I mean, there are different ways to, to set it up. I guess yeah, that's well, I'm trying to make. it's interesting when we were when I was uh, the chief revenue officer for about six months at a company called BizAssure, we had a marketing team that was totally critical. I mean, it was a small team, right? A small marketing, small sales team. And they became really essential in the sales process because they had to generate new content for us to help close deals. It was like, hey, this guy's asking for a document that shows X, Y and Z. We know we do those things, but we need to dress it up. Can you can you possibly create that for us? And so we added an incentive plan on top of their typical, you know, marketing pay. It was like, all right, you're going to get a little piece of the action as well if it closes because you're you're a, a totally necessary part of that process. So as we look at who all really gets involved, I think we can compensate equally or, or correctly across the board, uh, and then it doesn't become just sales. But yeah, you got to you got to remain open to these different models and see what works for your company in your market selling your product. Yeah, I, I like that too. I mean, just bringing everybody together as the overall, you know, revenue team versus yeah. having all these different silos. Everyone's on a, di- you know, different page. They're all working toward different goals. It's like it's easier with smaller teams, goal? right? Right. Obviously, uh-huh. it's way easier with smaller sure. teams. I worked with startups for a long time, so that's been I could implement that at almost any of my clients previously. But yeah, you know, the bigger companies you work with, it can get harder. They can feel more removed. Uh, when I was inside sales.com, I started publishing on LinkedIn. It was like by, you had to like get accepted into publishing on LinkedIn back in the day. I remember writing an article <laughs> kind of about that idea and it was, it was fairly well received. So I, I think there's a lot to say for switching up the model, being open to it and, and changing just the way you're thinking of this. So this is the status quo that if you want different results, you got to do different things. Exactly. Okay, cool. So, so say a like a founder of a company comes up to you and they go okay we need we know that we need to go outbound we know that we need to start you know penetrating some of the bigger accounts our product mm-hmm. works we've got a few customers already like how do you how do you work with them to implement you know some of the stuff that you laid out in the book yeah so if if they're a company that's going from inbound to outbound, if they've already got an inbound process, it's a little bit different. Let's say that they've got a handful of clients, though, that they, let's assume that they just got them because of network and, you know, people that they knew from previous jobs, and they landed a few clients, how they have to go outbound. um, It really, it always comes back to what is what we call your swim lane. Where, Where are those companies? What are the descriptors that really tell you exactly who you can help? Is it their industry? Is it their size? Is it their location? Is it the number of decision makers? Is, what are those things that are going to help you? And then you can build an accurate list. And you know, going from zero sales to one sale is as easy as, okay, let's start calling those people. Let's start having the conversations. So you don't have to dive into outbound like all or nothing. We're putting a million dollars down to really build out this whole process. I need an SVP, a VP, a senior director, and a director of sales. We don't have to do all of that. If we're small enough where we're trying to start outbound, 
Uh, we can certainly just build that really, really targeted list. And that's the most important thing you can do. And then, you know, if you're a founder and you don't yet have a sales team and you haven't sold significantly yourself, I would highly recommend that founders sell on their own, that they be the salesperson at first so that they can understand both the value of the sales role, but also all of the challenges that are coming up, all the questions the actual customers are asking, the actual prospects are asking if their targeted list is really that targeted. Um, so I love to work with founders. I love that idea of helping them to become better salespeople, even if they're really technical people, even if they're not salespeople at all. So I would say start with the list, figure out if that's something you're going to be comfortable enough going after yourself or if for scaling purposes, if for time management purposes, you need to do this through another salesperson. I'm always scared to recommend just going out and hiring somebody because you really need the process. You really need things built out for them so that you can properly set that their expectations. But yeah, build the list, put the tools in place and be, uh, depending on how much funding you have, be as minimal as you need to be but also think about what tools are going to maximize your success, right? So I love to recommend tools like Connect and Sell because they will they will literally 10x your results. They'll take anything you could do and 10x it with just the same number of actual people. But a lot of the clients I've worked with didn't have the capital for that. You know, they, they don't have that kind of money up front. So be as minimal as you need to be, you know, stay as close to the sales process as you can as a founder, and ideally, don't hire until you're, you're really sure that you've got something, that you've got the process at least ready for somebody to come in and copy and paste it. I love that. That is such great advice. And that, that's also for sales development managers. I think folks you know, get promoted out of being the, the only SDR. You know, they mm-hmm. bring on a team, and it's just like the first thing they, they did, never want to uh, do any more prospecting. <laughs> you know, they're just like, okay, I'm the yeah. boss now. Like, everybody else can do it. But I mean, at the end of the day, you still have to be in there making calls, sending out emails, you know, running the process because otherwise you're just in kind of an ivory tower, it seems. Yeah. And and if you're an early stage company or if you're an early stage outbound team, either way, it's the same idea, right? You've got to be in there. You've got to actually see what really is being done and said. You've got to be a part of that conversation. And I always love the idea of leading by example. I think that that's the most important thing you can do to inspire early sales reps to keep going is to be the one doing it yourself. So I totally agree with you there. Exactly. And, you know, even the founder, I'm sure the first thing they want to do is hire a salesperson so they don't have to deal with sales anymore. But but, uh, I would say going out on calls, you know, getting on airplanes, visiting customers, listening to the customers and staying close is like... That's advice you get from all the big, you know, successful company founders. They still go out oh, yeah. and do that. They've got their finger on the pole. So, well, it, it was interesting. Ends. I listened to a podcast a while, a few years ago, in fact, where the founder of Yesware said a founder should sell until they hit $1 million annual recurring revenue. Now, I don't know that that's feasible for everybody. Of course, that's kind of a big, bold statement, but I love that idea that you've got to have a significant amount of evidence that this is worth handing off to a sales rep or a sales team, that this thing is worth scaling. It, you know, Funding kind of makes people do crazy things, so it's a little easier if you're bootstrapped that you can do that. You can be the one making the sales because no one's telling you, hey, you need to scale tomorrow. But I think that's really, really true that as much as you possibly can, be the first salesperson. Yeah. Then figure out how to kind of turn that into a process and copy and paste. Because it's not going to be it's not going to be magic. It shouldn't be magic that gets you closed deals. It shouldn't just be your personal network to hit a million dollars ARR. I mean, you've done something right, clearly. Right. There, you got to go out and do it, and yep. you learn so much. And then, okay, so now you've got the target account list that you want to hit. Where do you get the the names of the people that are appropriate for you, so that you have enough? material to start calling and perhaps give to like a company like connect and sell. So you have to buy it. Well, so we talk about it in the book. Actually, this is one of the things that we get a lot of questions on is where on earth do you get the data, right? Because it's easy enough to go on LinkedIn or go on the Inc 500 and say, okay, here's 30 target companies, but how do you find those people? So there's obviously there's, there's lead scraping tools. I'm a big fan of hunter.io or I think it's just hunter.io they're a great tool for just getting email addresses, right? But that's not very scaled. Now, you can upload a whole list of contacts, but you've got to know who those people are, or you can upload a list of companies. It's just, it's not that efficient. 
Databases and list vendors are obviously the most efficient because you can buy access to tens of thousands of records. You can buy a list of tens of thousands of records. And that's a little more budget intensive. You can use social networks like LinkedIn. Twitter used to be a big one. AngelList is still one that you could find you know, a list of people on who might be within your target market. It depends on who you're going after. And then finally, like associations, in-person events, networking groups, those types of places where you know that your buyers live and breathe. This is a place where they're going to be. You can usually buy a list from them or just go be a part of them and start to network and grow closer to that, that kind of space. And then you can start to build a list of your contacts there. So yeah, it's kind of a sliding scale from like the way far end where it's manual lead scraping or contacting one-to-one at an in-person event all the way up to buying a huge list. It depends on your budget, depends on your market, depends on what kind of vendors even have the data available. So Right. Bottom line, hustle. <laughs> like, yeah. You well, got to go out and get the names. Yeah. And always, in all things, try and close a, a few sales before trying to close a million sales. Like yeah. don't start by buying 50,000 records. Start by buying a thousand records. You know, start by buying two hundred records. Call a few of them, have the conversations, adjust your pitch, adjust your process, adjust your approach from there. Then go buy another thousand records. Don't don't go full bore into this thing unless you've got someone advising you who can really help you make sure that you're you're answering those questions early on before you go and spend a bunch of money on the wrong things. Yeah, and the process is is tight, and and you you yeah. feel comfortable with it. And then, okay, so the last thing now you've you've got the the hit list of accounts, you've got some names in there. What about messaging? Like you said that you're you're a big messaging guy. Where do I start as far as like do I have to write a voicemail script or a <laughs> phone script? The emails, like where do you start with the whole messaging process? So this is, again, another thing we, we kind of break down in, in the book. We give a basic format for a cold call, you know, some basic tips for an email because that could take almost any form you can imagine. But the goal in all of this is, is one, I mean, the very first thing you want to do is stand out. You want to catch their attention. You want to get them to listen to you in a good way, not in a way that's going to make them angry, but in a way that, okay, kind of stops them in their tracks, right? And the next thing you need to do is prove that you can solve a problem. Now, if you don't have a lot of social proof, you don't have uh, case study after case study, you don't know, uh, you know, I get a lot of this advice out there on LinkedIn that I see, find a specific company in your history of case studies that matches the same problem they're experiencing in their same industry. Well, yeah, that's really nice. But I worked with a lot of earlier stage companies than that who don't have those case studies. You need to at least understand the problem that you solve and provide them with some evidence that you can solve it, right? So ideally, some sort of proof from a real company you've worked with, but also even content, just saying, here's the problem that we see a lot of others are facing. How are you handling that today? Getting them to open up that conversation, if that's over email, if that's over phone call. So first stand out, then help them to understand that you can solve a problem. And then really early on in the conversation, you're just trying to sell the next conversation. You're not trying to sell them on a $10,000 a month deal. You're literally just trying to sell them on, hey, is this a problem you're experiencing that you need help solving? Great. Let's set up the next conversation. So that's what we love about sales development. I loved working in it and I love coaching in it because you're really, your job isn't so stinking hard. You think it's so much work, but really you're not working with multiple buyers yet. You're not working with these massive decision-making groups. You know, you're not working with budgeting and timing. You're really just saying, is there a problem? You know, we think we can solve it. Is this worth your time to, to consider whether or not we can? Yep, exactly. And to some extent, it, it does become a numbers game, really, because especially with outbound, because if you go back to the doctor analogy, I mean, you're, you're going up to them and going, do you have this, this symptom? <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, and asking them some good questions. And, and quite frankly, if they don't, you got to move on until they're ready to engage with you if they do have that particular symptom. Yeah, um, I mean, imagine so. you're a doctor who can cure leprosy and you go to a leper colony. Well, you've got a pretty good idea. Like you've targeted correctly. <laughs> yeah, there you a go. Much, much better chance. Than if you walk into, you know, a, a grocery store in L.A., like you've got a much better chance of finding the right people. So it is in <laughs> some sense a numbers game. It's also in some sense just being really smart about who you're talking to. Yeah. Don't waste your own time. Don't waste somebody else's time. Know exactly who that is that you can actually help. And then it's not so much I need to have a thousand conversations like I need to have 10 great conversations and I'll probably get a deal. Like I'll probably make this happen because I know I'm talking to the right people. 
So it really, it starts way back there in the targeting phase. Yeah, like a leper doctor talking to a leper colony. You know you're going to get somebody who, who wants to get healed today. Right. No, it's a great analogy. And, and I like how you, you, it's kind of a foundational approach to start with the targeting, the targeting, the targeting, the targeting, because especially yep. if you're like, you know, two co-founders who are starting to bring on a couple of clients and you, you, you know that you need to go out, you just don't have time to call, you know, everybody no way. in the United Even States. Even with the best yeah. tools in the world. Yeah. If yeah. you have an hour a day. Right. And so there's the other thing though, that you can provide is a better offer. Mm. everybody's asking for 15 minutes of their time. If you send them a gift first, if your prospecting approach is in a cold call, but uh, you know, I listened to a great podcast. I'll have to send you the notes on this one, but a great podcast about gift giving as a way to build a relationship, as a way to start a conversation. Yeah. Maybe you send 10 amazing gifts, like really personalized, really cool. Not just a t-shirt with your brand name on it and a water bottle. I mean like actually cool gifts. You're probably going to get five conversations. And that was more effective for you as a founder with very little time on your hands than 100 cold calls, sure. Now, I still believe that you should use everything in your power, every resource you have you know, available to you. But there are ways, if you can provide a better offer, if you can give them something more in terms of value up front, you're going to see a lot more success. And that's another thing that's challenging with sales development is you don't really get to control the offer. So if yeah. you're a typical SDR, you don't get to say anything other than, do you have 15 minutes to sit down with my account executive? So that can be challenging. But if you're a founder, you've got so much leeway. You can decide, you know what? We're going to give these guys a free day of service. We're going to give them a free month. We're going to give them whatever. Uh, and you can control that offer and have way more success than you would if you were just kind of shooting from the hip, hoping that somebody's got 15 minutes that they don't care whether or not they waste. Right. And and that that's a really good point you're making because a lot of times – the SDR's whole workflow is set up by somebody else and they, oh, they, yeah. they come in and it's just like press a button and make a hundred cold <laughs> calls and, you know, hope for the best. And it's like, yeah. if you show a little bit of creativity in some situations, it's almost frowned upon because it's like, you're supposed to be making a hundred calls, you know? Yeah. And, and I'll tell you what, if your manager comes to you, so this is for all the SDRs listening. If your manager comes to you and hands you a script, as I once received from one of my managers as an SDR, and the manager says, never vary from this script. It's perfect. And you're selling B2B. You need to find another job. Like your manager cannot tell you how you will be <laughs> successful over the phone. Cold calling is an art. It requires that you both, you take a script, you take a well thought out plan and you adapt it to your personality. I have a way different style than Ryan Reiser, who I co-authored the book with, right? So we're not going to use the same script in the same way. So yeah, maybe you can't control everything. You can't control hardly anything, but you can control how well you do on that call. And that's what you need to own because nobody else owns that but you. Now, if your manager is trying to own that and they're trying to say, you know, you never, ever, ever vary from one word of the script, never, you know, laugh where I say, ha ha in the script. <laughs> Yeah, you drop that, drop that company and run. There's too many good opportunities for you to be staying there forever. I don't advocate people job hopping. I was a job hopper for a time and I've experienced the challenges from that. But, you know, don't make the excuse either that somebody else controls your world and so you can't control anything. There are absolutely things within your control and especially your conversation quality. That's a skill set that you can own and that will take you much further than just an SDR at some software company today. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, it's it's hard to know if you're in a bad situation, like should I should I stick it out? Should I stay mm -hmm. in here and hopefully it'll get better? Um, <laughs> or is this just like beyond and I should go to another situation which may not be that much better anyways? It's always tricky, but it's it's it, the one thing that's constant is you take your skill set with you. Absolutely. Where, you know, and all everything that you've learned. So Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is great, man. So I got you for another couple minutes here. What is next for you? Now you got the book out there. You've got your company going. What are you excited about right now? Well, the world is my oyster, man. <laughs> <laughs> As it is for every salesperson uh, with some skills. So nice. Yeah, right now I'm, I'm really focusing on doing outbound sales consulting. I like to help build processes, optimize messaging, really enable great hiring, those sorts of things around outbound sales. I've definitely, I've, I've branded myself as outbound because 
It's one of the most challenging things you'll ever do, but it's one of the most valuable things you can build for your company. But then on the other side, I also love coaching. I love talking to sales reps who are struggling individually. Uh, you know, I have people message me randomly on LinkedIn who say, hey, just read the book or just saw this article, you know, I thought it was really great. And I'll message them back like, what can I help you with? Send me a script, send me an email template or something. I'll love to help you out. So, uh, you know, for those listening, if you want to send me something, if I don't have time, I'll tell you. But if I have time, I'd love to look through something and help you out because I just love being a part of that world and staying relevant. Because, you know, as soon as you go from SDR to AE to business owner, you make that big jump, right? You're, you're now outside that world. It can be so easy to become irrelevant. So I always appreciate people staying in touch with me and saying, Rex, you know, how can you help me? And then I can understand what, what actual challenges they're going through. So yeah, consulting, coaching, that sort of stuff. And then uh, possibly some other really exciting things in the works here that I'll keep you guys in, in, in tune to. Excellent. Excellent. And it's easy to, to contact you. You're obviously all over LinkedIn, but it's yeah. uh, the website is just um, rexb.co, right? Yep. Rexb.co. It's super easy to remember. My last name is Biberston, so you can imagine why I didn't want to buy rexbiberston.com. It's a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Makes it easy. Yeah. Well, Rex, thank you so much for all the tips. Absolutely. I took a ton of notes. I think uh, this is super valuable and we'll see you over on LinkedIn. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Sales Development Podcast, the only audio forum 100% focused and dedicated to sales development with your host, David Delaney. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube and take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes. Your support makes our show possible. If you are struggling with your sales development program, contact us at 10bound.com for a no-obligation exploratory call. Again, that's 10bound.com.